just a bit of a content warning. Uh, this video involves footage of a sad, soggy kitten. He's probably fine, but I'm, I've, I thought it was upsetting. Hi, I'm Magdalene Rose. And yes, I did cut my hair in my bathroom. <laughs> Thanks for noticing. When I was in college, I fell in love with anthropology and I pursued it in the hopes of one day becoming a museum curator. Now I make YouTube videos. One of the problems I hear about the internet, well not hear, read, <laughs> I don't actually talk to people, is that social media is so toxic and it's true. Spending a day on social media can be exhausting and stressful the American Academy of Pediatrics warned that it could be particularly harmful to young people, and the problem doesn't stop at mental health. The amount of stress that social media causes creates an increase in the stress hormone cortisol in the body, so it's damaging physical health as well. The obvious solution here is that we all put down our phones and go outside, but I'm not going to do that, and neither are you. However, once I began to understand more about how these different platforms decide what content goes in my feed, I realized I had more control over it than I originally thought. I could curate my social media, which is almost like having a job. A computer for women. How did the idea come about? I had the idea in a dream originally, and then the next night I dreamt about it again. Then I probably had the same dream for the next 40 or 50 nights. And I thought, yes, I'll do that. People actually curate their social media without even knowing it. I mean, who hasn't mindlessly clicked on whatever's loud and in your face? But this is like going to the grocery store hungry. You're not gonna get anything that actually nourishes you. You're just going to get a straight shot of dopamine. <laughs> dopamine is commonly thought of as the pleasure chemical in your brain that you get when you experience something enjoyable. But this isn't actually correct. Dopamine is actually the neurotransmitter immediately preceding these experiences. It creates the appetite and motivation to seek out rewards. This is thought to be why people who struggle with depression find it nearly impossible to do even basic tasks that could improve their situation. The decrease of dopamine means they have no motivation to spur themselves to action. The excitement of trying a new hobby is going to supply your brain with dopamine. Same with the anticipation of a runner's high. However, the eagerness to know what's next on the never-ending scroll of your social media, that is also going to give you a shot of dopamine. And your brain, on a chemical level, can't tell the difference. The problem we face now is our world is full of easily attainable dopamine. The scrolling mechanic of social media is particularly addictive because it's constantly refreshing your feed with new and exciting things. In a study on addiction, mice were given a lever that they could press at any time. When they press it, a sensor hooked up to their brain activates their dopamine neurons. According to the study, the mouse quickly starts to show the telltale signs of addictive behavior as they happily keep pressing the lever to receive more and more dopamine. If after two hours we didn't take them out of the cage, they wouldn't eat, they wouldn't drink, then they'd probably die quickly. So when you're laying in bed at 2 a.m. and you're tired and you know you have to get up early but you can't stop scrolling through Instagram, you're basically a mouse hooked up to a dopamine lever. But I digress. This video is not about why you should stop using social media, although you should, and so should I. This is about better choosing the content we're marinating our brains in on a near constant basis. Because if we're not going to stop, we might as well be making better choices. Modern life is overwhelmed by content tailor-made to mash that dopamine lever constantly. Not because it benefits mankind, but because it's good for sales. This is an important point to understand before you start curating. Most content put out online is not innocently hoping to put a smile on your face or make you laugh. It is made to tap you like a resource. Always consider the intent of a post. Are they trying to sell you something? Are they pushing a cause or an ideology? When you pay attention to Instagram especially, you begin to see you're just scrolling through commercials. Curating your timeline is all about removing and improving. 
Now, I am not a statistician, and I don't actually know the mathematical equation for how the different social media platforms respond. What I can say is that these tips have worked for me, and I'm confident that they can work for others too. Keep in mind that everything you click on, when you like a video, retweet on Twitter, whenever you engage with a post in any way, the algorithm sees that and takes note of it. I suspect this even counts on Instagram when videos autoplay, which is why there's this trend of videos that don't really have any substance, but they're really satisfying to watch. Like I've gotten stuck in loops of just watching people cut soap. Like that's what I did that day. Ask yourself, what are you telling the algorithm right now? Are you telling them you like soap cutting videos? Because that's what you're getting more of. On the other hand, if you're stuck, mesmerized by this video of a poor helpless kitty who just got hit by a car and trying to keep it alive and oh God, don't you feel sorry for this poor little kid? Stop. This video was made to evoke an intense emotional response. It's emotionally manipulating you for engagement and revenue. Additionally, and this is my own personal conspiracy theory about sad animal videos, I wouldn't be surprised if some of these videos are people actually putting animals in those situations for content. If you see one of these videos, something that's just obviously made to provoke you or make you feel worse about yourself, most platforms have a way of saying, I don't wanna see any more from this creator. That tells the algorithm you are not interested in this type of content and will start showing you less and less as you continue to remove it from your timeline. Are you hydrating? Hydrate. While you're removing toxic content from your timeline, also let them know what you do want to see. And here's where you need to parent yourself a little bit. Like, what should you be marinating your brain in constantly? Positive affirmations? Travel vlogs? Interesting factoids about history? It's up to you what you put in the mix. Think of it as if you were setting up a timeline for your 10-year-old self. What would you want them to see? What would it be good for them to be exposed to on a near constant basis? It's something to think about. One of my personal favorites is an Instagram account called Discovering Lost Souls. That's all unclaimed photographs. No one knows who they are. And sometimes people even come forward and claim photos of their grandparents. But it's fascinating to me because like all anthropologists, I'm a very nosy and intrusive person. <laughs> On Twitter, I like bodega cats, literally just pictures of cats in corner stores. <laughs> well, how do you tell the algorithm you like it? You like, comment, and subscribe. Make sure you're searching for keywords and sharing the content too. The more you add wholesome and healthy content to your feed, the more the algorithm will add. And there's a lot of cool content out there. In the comments, please let me know your favorites so everybody can get ideas. Now, there is an inherent snag in this model, and that's politics. A lot of people get their news this way. And I stand by what I said in my video about yellow journalism, don't get your news from social media. But this can get messy, especially in times when the only way to find out what's really going on is to watch the live stream of a protester who's on the ground. Or you may end up hearing from Buffalo, New York local news that this man fell backwards dramatically. Oh yeah, sure he did. This is a valid concern because you can't just totally cut yourself off from what's happening politically. That in itself is a political stance and it's a bad one. However, consuming political news on a constant basis is just bad for you. And I say this with love, politics should not be your hobby. I know the word echo chamber has been misused to the point of being meaningless, but they do exist. And this is how you get trapped in one. Like this is how people become convinced that the world is on the brink of a race war or that the US is really close to accepting socialist ideology. Like neither of these things are true, but they may look true if you're looking at it through a very specific lens. Also, if you're someone who cares a lot about politics, you can feel obligated to engage with news and politics constantly. But I promise you, this sort of thing leads to more burnout than direct action. I recommend finding a handful of sources you trust and cutting the rest. Okay, so to summarize, taking control of your social media feed is good for your mental and physical health. You can do so by removing toxic and manipulative content and replacing it with healthier outlets. Political news is important, but you should limit it to a few trusted sources. 
If you do these things, it will relieve feelings of stress, anxiety, and depression. That is not to say it will cure them, but it will take a wholly unnecessary weight off your shoulders. And that is worth doing. Thanks for watching my video on how to curate your social media. If you have not yet thrown your phone into the ocean, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. <laughs> Until next time, team.